Hi there, everyone. I am Danny, spiritualtherapist.com. Let me just pop my teeth in. Hello, everyone. I'm Danny, spiritualtherapist.com, and she's back. We are having the lovely Andrea Fouts back with us today. We did a little broadcast last week. Some of you had questions, and we're going to go straight into a couple of those questions. But first of all, Andrea Fouts, soul awakener soul whisperer, past life regression expert. Welcome. Thank you, lovely Danny. <laughs> That's a <laughs> lovely introduction. I think, I think the thing is, when we work on this level, we can be whatever people really need, really. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. As long as we're coming from a loving space and both of you, both of us are very qualified in different therapeutic modulars that we can then bring into our kind of spiritual mentoring and caring for, you know, the people that come to us. So last week we had some people that we invited to ask questions. And the, fir the first one is from Tesseract. Hello, Tesseract. And this lady asks about changing timelines and that she feels that she's on one timeline one minute and another timeline the next, and it's very confusing. What say you to this? Ooh, I think, I think they, in the, in the bigger picture, are running different timelines anyway. I think there's different timelines running. And then I think your personal vibration can determine which timelines you're running on. You know, so I hear people talking about there's different realities running and I've experienced different realities myself. Like I've seen things phase in and out of reality and I've been here with a client once and we looked out and we saw a combine harvester in the field and we both thought that looks a bit odd. Like how did that combine harvester get there? And the guy was dressed not like a Somerset farmer in Glastonbury. And we looked at each other and both saw this man, looked back and he was gone. And we both saw that. So it was phasing into a different timeline. So it's a bit like how I suppose people see ghosts, isn't it? It depends on your frequency. So, you know, if you're moving into different timelines, past, present, future, the thing that I think is the most crucial is that you're able to determine which timeline is a collective timeline that they're running at this point in time and also your own personal reality, which can merge into the collective timeline. So you're running a timeline which is benevolent and loving and beneficial to you, yet it merges with a timeline that's running, but you're on a higher frequency version of that timeline. Does that make sense? Kind, yeah, it does. And do you think it's because there's so many people now really working on themselves, doing their inner work, bringing up things from the past, from childhood, from teenagers, from 20s, etc. And there's this subconscious, unconscious healing that's happening. There's a lot of triggers getting pulled. As we're going through this mass healing, the energy on the planet has shifted. It's becoming lighter and more higher, higher in vibration. And I feel that that also could be elements why we think, oh my God, what time is it? Where am I? Why am I feeling like this? Didn't I just do that? Shouldn't I have done that? Who am I talking to? I thought I was talking to somebody else. Do you think that has something to do with it too? I think so. And also, if you look at the work you're doing and the work I'm doing, we talked about this earlier, we're here in whatever country we're in, like I'm in the UK or in Costa Rica, but yet we're working with people all over the world, over the internet. So we're in all these different time timelines as well like times of day so we're not fixed in a reality even though we look like we're physically in one place we're emotionally and energetically in lots of timelines in lots of different countries yeah definitely and on that note i'd like to apologize to the four beautiful people today that got on my zoom at different times it was either me it could have been you it could have been the universe it could be that bloody change of time because in costa rica they don't change the clock it's just annoying in america canada australia england stop it everyone should be on the same time it is a confusion it is made to confuse it causes such upset in third world countries for example people trying to do business there's even a couple of states in america that are like we're not changing the time oh, really? zone no 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 yeah yeah and if we don't know this 
often we discover these things like that when we discover them for not good reasons because we're waiting for somebody who was is going to come on in two hours time which is what happened to me today um amazing just amazing all this um conversation timelines jumping timelines inner healing regression now we also spoke about and again i'm going to get to the other questions but you and i just had a conversation and a concern that i raised in um past life regression now i am a past life regression therapist i'm a clinical hypnotherapist and do this time therapy regression too but i wouldn't dream of doing such delicate work over the internet I know oh, we just talked about that didn't we mm. and I've done you know I think I said in my other thing I've done this work for 20 years I do past life regression in a child healing ancestral timeline healing but in the work that I do over the internet I do reading the emotional Akashic record using my intuition now I'll tune into past lives in a child ancestral and entities and I deal a lot with entities but I would never in a million years, and I tell people all the time, do not do regression over the internet because you're taking people into, you know, alpha, beta, theta, delta states of mind. And the, like we said, the internet could go down and you're leaving somebody in a vulnerable state, space where you can't connect with them. And, yeah. you know, having done this work, you know, there are people who are used to doing deep inner work and they might take themselves very deeply in a Skype session, but you're not going to go very deep in general and you would be self-guided in that through your own ability and where you're at. But if you're someone who's not used to doing kind of deep emotional regression and you go, I, I know from having sat with people who you know, I, I'm shocked at what's happened to them. And thankfully I'm in the room to guide them and pull them out of their body so that they're looking down on it. They're not emotionally involved because a lot of emotion can come up. And if you're sat in a room on your own, you know, or lay down in a room on your own, I can't go over and touch you or, you know, help you in any way because you're the other side of the world. Yeah, so I would yeah. say no, don't, don't go to anybody who does actual regression and I certainly also would question anybody who was doing qualified sort of hypnosis courses where you get a certificate and and all the work there has been no work done in person where you've actually physically met the people yeah do you agree yeah I do I'm, I'm really concerned about this and you know because a lot of us are working you know on you know like this on zoom and uh, you know I would never regress somebody online who has the possibility of hitting some real childhood trauma or some off-planet trauma because they have no idea how their body's going to respond the physical shaking the screaming the terrible awful wretched things that can happen with a person that's having a a massive healing in the moment you know i it, it does concern me so i really do urge everyone please be very careful and you know love yourself enough on this journey of healing and self-revelation don't put yourself completely in the hands of somebody who's not physically in the room and when i am working on inner child deeply um i have two men i did in the last two months and i had their wives outside of the room Everyone was planned, prepared, because I've got these two men in particular on a certain program and they're doing a lot of deep work. So the wives were outside the room while they did an inner child connection with me like this. And then I text the wife and the wife goes in. But before that, it's set up because what if the internet drops, like you said, you know, but it's so, so you, we can handle it safely that way but we don't want to take someone down into such a deep hypnotic state. They can't come up and out healthily. They, they don't want to come up thinking, Oh, I'm on a mixed timeline. Who am I? You know, it's frightening. It's frightening for people. It really yeah, is. So just get people who say, you know, we do work over Skype because they're in the UK sometimes. And then I say, you know, I think because of where you're at and I often talk about, you've got to drop, I always talk about this dropping into your emotional self. And I can see with some people, they struggle to drop into that emotional self. So they're intellectually listening to what you're saying, and they're processing it on a intellectual level, but they're not processing it deeply enough. And yet you could have someone else you did exactly the same with, 
and they could drop into their emotional self and process it. So sometimes I say to them, I think you'd get a benefit out of coming to actually see me in person and go into this deep level to get to that little thing that I can't get to by doing this over the internet. But I think without saying about people in the UK, I just think people in America are, and I'm sure you have a lot of clients in America, it's people in America are used to therapy. They're used to doing this inner work. Um, whether they've gone through conventional talking to a psychotherapist for a while and then realized actually I need to move on to a more spiritual level of processing now I'm going a lot deeper with it than just talking about my stuff whereas in England I think you know because I did this stuff on TV people thought oh past life regression really interesting but actually once they came to do the inner work they realized that they were going into inner child ancestral and healing that but out of choice they would have never thought oh i need to heal some inner child things um because i think in general in the uk we're fairly new into this therapy and certainly into doing inner child healing you know it's a new concept for people and often i say to people i don't know if you've seen that book it's called toxic parents overcoming their hurtful legacy by susan forward and often when you say to english people oh you might want to buy this book they often go oh no that sounds like a betrayal of my family to buy such a title yet actually even the act of buying the book is setting the intention to heal that aspect of yourself because you're breaking the family dynamic as well yeah very true so people that we decide to pay for sessions in whatever regard it's really important to find out whether or not that therapist has done their own inner work because we don't want to be giving our vulnerable selves to someone who doesn't have the ability to emote to the depths of compassion or matching frequency that truly are in a position to help you on your healing journey. So we're gonna to move to question number two. Um, it was Sue W. Hi Sue. Um, she asks, um, past trauma, how long does it take to heal? And what she's referring to specifically is, she's had spinal surgery, her brother had spinal surgery, her mother had spinal surgery. So there is a timeline here of an ancestral issue that's carried through the bloodline. People think everything is genetic. What do you say to that? Well, they've obviously got a pattern of healing it by deciding to have surgery because that's what they've learned to, you know, we've got this ancestral issue. From my perspective, there's an emotional issue. So we've got to heal the ancestor, the original ancestor who had issue with their spine and go into the story of the ancestor so to hear the story of the ancestor so you've got to go into the timeline find the ancestor that had the original trauma then also check that you don't have so that's your birth lineage and then you've got to check the soul lineage just to check you haven't got a backup trauma in your soul lineage which is your past life lineage so you're healing the ancestral lineage which is the DNA lineage, and then you're healing the soul lineage. So once you get to the origin of the story and you heal that, you can heal the timeline and then it doesn't have to keep manifesting. So, you know, the next generation won't have to, if you heal it, the next generation won't have to have surgery because it won't even be in their energy field. It will be deleted emotionally and energetically from the Akashic records to be neutral it might be there but it's neutral it's dormant the story's not still running like i suppose a good analogy to give is i had a client who she had breast cancer and we were looking at how she'd manifested this and when we went back in a few generations so i don't know if we talked about this the last time because it's just a great story mm. um, she'd gone into her great great grandmother's story who'd been the elder sibling in the family her youngest sibling of her great great grandmother so this the sister had had a child of course it was not a time on the planet when you could keep the baby so she'd had to give the baby away the eldest sister had arranged for the baby to be given away 
her great great grandmother had held the trauma of that experience in her in her heart in her breast tissue and that trauma had never been healed and that was part of the contributing factor to this trauma in her breast tissue and so once she healed the trauma yeah. it then releases it energetically yeah it's incredible it's so incredible how powerful we are how much healing we can do without looking at necessarily just relying on conventional western ways but to go into the soul into the body into the cellular memory and i know this is one of the, the healing services that you offer for people that you could really help people go back find the origin and heal up that ancestral trauma so we can end the patterns beautiful beautiful all right sue i hope that helps you and ultimately i don't think there really is a, a length of time to heal something i know that there are people that can have a session with someone like andrea focusing on the ancestral finding the origin and then it is taken out the trauma is released so well, it's already, it's down to the individual it's like that you know you can you can access this you know you a lot of people don't even need to see the story. You know, if you can access divine forgiveness, it can heal in a second. I mean, or some people you think, oh, <laughs> you've got to get to that next level because it's the emotion of it's got to come out. And, you know, sometimes I'm sure you hear the same. I say to people, how long do you think they've been holding on to that? And they're like, I've been holding on to that for 50 years in this lifetime. And, you know, and I can see it's like 26 lifetimes or something. And you think, wow. And that and they go and it's been healed in half an hour, you know, and that's your potential. You know, you're carrying this round for lifetime after lifetime, year after year after year, and then you finally get ready to release this and it's gone in half an hour or a yeah. few minutes. And, and we are, human beings are so powerful. We are so beautifully strong and powerful in ways that we are only some of us coming to understand through spiritual healing, ancestral healing, understanding metaphysics. There isn't a degree needed. There isn't a, an encyclopedia of learning to be done. We're learning how to access our own energy from us, from our inner battery, from our soul battery. And it makes me so happy that people are really looking at other ways to bring about peace of mind, to let go of stress and anxiety without pill popping or relying on a doctor for bills they can't afford anymore, which we're going to come to in terms of how do we make a living. So now I'm going to move to question number three, and I have to read this one. This is from Dolores. Hi, Dolores. Oh, you cannot minimize. Okay. 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 Where did you go, honey? How do I... Um, I just checked it, but now we're recording. So, all right. I'm going to just tell you the story because I've read it several times. So Dolores had a being that would come to her, a white orb, and she called it father from a child. And she asked and asked and asked over time, who is this? Who is this father, this being that represents itself in this white, beautiful orb? And then she had a complication and she was in hospital and it was complications from chemotherapy. And she demanded that this father white orb came to her and when it came to her, she demanded to see who this is. And a white extraterrestrial stood before her. And she was not pleased. And she felt shame and guilt coming from this being that had plugged into her all of these years, allowed her to feel there was some kind of God-like, father-like connection, but what was standing in front of her was some kind of rank extraterrestrial. She said the next day she was in bed and she awoken and she saw a, a cord tethered from her going nowhere. And she realized that that extraterrestrial had removed itself. And so it should have done. So wanted to share that with you. She wanted to ask about that and ask what your thoughts are on that. Okay. We could... <laughs> Oh, it's such a subject. The thing is, though, I think we go into the whole story about orbs. Not all orbs are the same thing. You know, I think some orbs are actual 
uh, babies waiting to be born, some, some are maybe passed over people, some are maybe benevolent beings, some are not. So it, I think it really requires huge levels of discernment and integrity in your own being. And I always ask, you know, only beings who are working for my soul's highest purpose um, can work with me or help me or anything at that level. And it's such a simple thing to say, you know, to really state that affirmation. And so, you know, she was looking for a father outside of herself, you know, instead of looking for the highest vibration of herself or benevolent beings, you know, so it's, it's the wording you use, which will draw in beings. And, you know, in our naivety, I think we've been involved in lots of things that we've agreed to in other timelines of existence or other you know, in another timeline of existence, you've probably thought, yeah, when I come to planet Earth, you know, that'll be okay. And so from that perspective of where you were before, and, and these are the conversations I've often had to interdimensional beings or benevolent ETs that mean, even the ones that mean well, from their perspective, perspective of the non-physical form it's very different when you're actually here on planet earth incarnated into a physical body it's a lot harder the experience of being in a physical body so from their perspective whether they're light years in the future you know and they're thinking oh it should be so easy for you or this or that or you know you made an agreement with them in another timeline to agree to do things or them to help you or you to help their planet to share information you know those things can become overwhelming um like we could get into a whole big topic about you know uh being in a birthing program for another planet you know i've had those experiences where um i've had to opt out of that program because you know my stomach used to swell up like i was nine months pregnant often i mean that's a whole subject in itself yeah when i travel i would go to a place and you know if i'd never been there before often my stomach would blow up and i'd be like oh no it's like i'm birthing or creating some interdimensional galactic baby linked to this place i've been to and you know oh it's all very nice idea having these you know interdimensional babies but actually i don't want to walk around looking like i'm nine months pregnant for three days and it's not IBS and it's not linked to what I've eaten and it's not linked to the fly. It's purely these interdimensional babies. And, you know, in my past incarnation in this lifetime, I was a model and it, it was even happening then. And then I just realized what was happening. And I just opted out of that program. I don't want to be in that program anymore. So no matter how woo woo you think things are, you know, and that's, for a lot of people really woo woo. So how can you heal something if you don't ever, if nobody, and as certainly in a 3D reality of TV or media, nobody's gonna tell you, oh, you might wanna, or, or healthcare professionals ever gonna go, hmm, I think <laughs> the stomach issue might be linked to some intergalactic program you're in with a birth thing, you know, thing with another planet. They'd have you locked up for that. Mm. But you, know, you need to heal, so you have to consider these things. But also I think it's to be very discerning in who you share this information with and being very grounded with it as well. Absolutely. There's so many things here. There's so many different ways that we could go. Looking at the real true fabric of the soul in the physical body, where we've been, where we're going, who we are, the information we come in with. One of the things that, a word that annoys the ass off of me, a statement, woo woo, woo woo, knock it off woo woo if you're frightened as a person about new information or information that really helps humanity grow but because people have said it's woo woo are you really so influenced by a word woo woo my ass look at the woo woo go there go explore go play because everything else right now is collapsing every system is collapsing the the authoritative energy on our planet the father figure, the mother figure. We are programmed from birth to look outside of ourselves. We have to, we have to, as babies, we're not gonna survive if we don't rely on a higher authority. But there comes a time where we've gotta take ownership of self. There are grown children 
30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, for example, who are still allowing their parent to treat them in the child-parent relationship. It's done. Yeah, however old you are now in terms of, you know, you need, let's say, let's talk from like, I don't know, 18 years. You still need guidance, of course, ideally, but all right, let's go 25. Let's just go there. 25 year olds on to the end of life. If you're still in a relationship with a parent energy where you go home, you talk to them when you feel like an idiot, you feel small, they're criticizing you, they're hurting you. Here's what you do. You grab hold of that little girl inside of you or that little boy inside of you. You sit that little one on your lap. You imagine wrapping your arms around that little one and you show that little one, look how big you got. Look, you're grown up now. You're grown up. And in that shift in resonance, in allowing yourself to come up and match energetically the parent energy, they do not have the hold anymore. And Andrea, this is something that I'm seeing everywhere, even the lady before you, the client I had before you, same thing. Yeah, same but thing. what I find which is really interesting is they usually take people back to the day they decided, because in your childhood, exactly what you've said, you've got to suck it up. You can't go live with the nice people down the road. Your parents are responsible for your food, your clothing, and your shelter. So you can't. So what you usually find is in doing inner child therapy with people is they'll go back to the day and I take them back to the day they decided the primary carer, which in general is the mum or the father, they decided their happiness was more important than their own. And then they gave their power away to the primary carer. So you need to heal the inner child back to the day where they reclaim that power. And we change the story from that day, whatever age it was they were and what their particular story was. And it can be something, you know, often you can see it's, you know, kids get excited running around in the park. And then you see the mum going, where were you? I lost you for 10 minutes, you naughty child. How dare you run off and have fun and enjoy yourself? wallet mm. and mm. of course then the child's really confused because it's like I actually had a really nice time for 10 minutes while I was running about I wasn't thinking you were worrying where I was and now I've upset you and my joy isn't worth having so making you happy is more important than my joy of having fun and running around and doing what I want to do yeah yeah absolutely you know and and just back to Sue and her um, share, sorry, Dolores, Dolores, sharing her, the being that had plugged into her, you know, that turned out to be some random, you know, extraterrestrial entity um, and how disappointed she was. But then she took the power back, you know, she demanded to see it. And so she took authority over. She was done. She was over it. She's like, show yourself. And it's things like this that we have to be very, very mindful of. It's the time to do that. I would say to people, you know, go inside, breathe in, breathe out, go into a nice, relaxed state, light up the inside out. Are there any plugins in you anywhere? Anything hidden? Is there a guru cap on your, on your crown chakra, which is basically feeding you all this religious, frightening, fearful doctrine? Isn't it time for you to take that cap off and just let your beautiful crown flourish? Because we didn't come here to be owned by any one person or any one being and people get addicted to guides they're like oh no it's my guide i'm like you have to let it go it's not, is it working for your soul's highest purpose and often there'll be like a kerfuffle in the background and it's like and then i ask have you finished your own earthly incarnations to these beings that often are portraying to be their guides and they're like no or they haven't even got a physical body and they're just you know hitchhiking on this person and the person's so in such a codependency with this guide and i'm saying well wouldn't you rather be connected to your own higher self your authentic self your multi-dimensional self wouldn't you rather be connected to that than these beings who might not be um, as evolved as your true soul potential is they might be limiting you and feeding so, off the energy, feeding yeah. off the battery energy, because they're draining that to make themselves feel better, but they're cloaked, hidden as well. I've got two more little quick examples, real-time examples of the authority figure, the 
being that plugs in and holds power over the human without their awareness. So my friend Nita Ryerson, um, she was um, just kind of hanging out with, uh, she's a very spiritual, clairvoyant, medium, amazing, beautiful lady who sadly is, has dementia right now. But um, she shared with me one day, a friend of hers, she was really upset, really kind of like, darling, what's the matter? And she said, oh, so-and-so just walked over and here I am in my, you know, we call them dungarees. They call it bib and brace in America. So Nita's in this really cute little, you know, outfit and she's feeling really good and she's lost some weight and she's done her hair and she's feeling confident and, you know, she's enjoying herself and her friend comes over and says, oh my God, my guide said, what are you wearing? You know, and it crushed her because it went right into the insecure little inner child inside of her. And I'm like, dude, you should have said, I think your guide's a bitch. You know what I mean? But we're like, some people are like, well, no, don't call the guides bitches or bastards. Oh, you mustn't say anything naughty because you might go to hell. You're not going to go to hell. It's an illusion. It's all bloody lies. Second example I have, I dated a guy very briefly years ago. I did not know he was a chronic alcoholic because he hid it for a couple of dates. So I'm at his house, it's the first time I've kind of gone there and we're watching a movie and I look in the far corner by the staircase, there is a gigantic demonic, a masculine demon in solid form staring at me. And because I've seen them my entire life, I'm like, whatever. So I turned to this guy and I said, there's a demon standing over there. I take the chance. If the guy runs by, you know, I'm like, I don't even, well, I'm, you know, whatever, completely unattached to um, anyone's dis discussion or decision of me. It doesn't keep me prisoner. But anyway, so um, he looked at me and I went, mate, there is a full blown demonic over there. And then this guy's like, oh man, I've got something to tell you. I'm like, okay, when I'm a full blown alcoholic, oh, I said, and that demonic has, is handling you is looshing from you, is encouraging you to drink. Yeah, right there. So that, he, and he said, I always felt like there's something. I'm not sure what it was. Is it God? Is it Jesus? Is it Hashem? Is it Jehovah? Is it Muhammad? Is it whoever? You know, and so all of these father figures, mother figures, hierarchical, um, you know, projections that we have, it is time to find our adult selves, our beautiful, benevolent, metaphysical, spiritual self, and take ownership. And we don't need permission. No, we don't need I think, permission. I think a lot of people who follow this old paradigm spiritual path is like, you know, it's almost like it keeps them down. You've, you've got to be worshipping these hierarchical figures. And I always say to people, if they see my house, I don't have any of these deities in my house. I have a statue of a, a, a blue being with blonde hair and she's got a gold baby inside of herself. <laughs> that, that's it. You know, I don't have any of these chitchy things because you know, you've got to neutral the energy of all these beings because you're just drawing that energy in. Connect to your multidimensional self and who you've been. And that will always bring you the highest vibration. Yeah, yeah. It's like, I've got a, I don't know if you can see over my shoulder, I've got a little Buddha. It's just, this, I love the face of this Buddha. And at night it's got a solar panel in it. So at night, the light comes on in its hands, it's lily pad that it's holding, and it lights up, and I think it's beautiful. I have not one aspect of religious connection to it. I have another Asian little Buddha in my bathroom, because it's pretty, I like it. I have a little gold angel over there in the corner. It's, it's a cherub. It's a Christmas decoration that I didn't want to put away. So I didn't, because I like it, you know what I mean? And yet you're right, you know, I've had the little Ganesh, you know, that removes all the obstacles. I've had the dancing Shiva, you know, played with all of these beautiful, iconic religious artifacts and symbologies, but no fright, no fear, no tyrannical allowance in my system from anything, from anything. If Jesus walked in now, I'd be like, mate, do you want a cup of tea? Good yeah. to see you again. You know, I haven't seen you since I was seven. How's it been going? It's the energy you give it, you know, like, you know, if you like it as an object, like a ornament or something, you know, um, I once had a happy Buddha statue at my little place at the beach in Cornwall. And I'd, I'd sort of realized that I didn't want these beings anymore. And it just disappeared. It just disappeared. It went. 
Wow. And so they do take themselves away if they, you know, they just took itself away. That was the end of it, you know. Or somebody a bit shifty was walking by thinking, oh, I think I can just help myself to that. However it happens, they're just like, Ooh. brilliant. All right, darling. Now you had a specific subject that you really want to share with our audience. Yeah, I just, I just was passionate today. And then, and then I messaged you and I just... You know, today they were passing, I mean, I'll, I'll say the date because, you know, some people might be watching this later. So today is the 9th of November, 2021 in the UK. And who knows when you, when you watch this, what will be happening in the future? But, you know, everyone in healthcare in the NHS is getting very worried and care work that they're going to be forced into making a choice that they perhaps don't want to make linked to the jibby jib. And... Um, you know, they're frightened and it hasn't actually been passed through Parliament yet. It's very close to it, but Parliament has to approve it. And so I think people need to, one, not panic and leave necessarily. You know, for some people, they may be wait till they're forced to leave. Don't run now if you don't feel confident in yourself, because it might not get passed. That's one thing. Also in America, I saw that a lot of healthcare workers are going to protest, I think, on Thanksgiving. A lot of people, like a lot. And even people who are supporting them who did choose to have the jibby jib um, are still supporting the right to choose. But outside of all this, what is going to happen is many people are going to find themselves without a job. And then they're panicking. Oh, my God, what am I going to do? especially if you've always been in employment if that's what you know being employed what i know and what danny knows for most of our lives and i certainly know from being 18 so 30 odd years of my working life i have been self-employed that is all i know being self-employed and i have never been in debt in my life and so i from my experience you know I know lots of people can tell people how they got out of debt. That has never, I can't teach you how to get out of debt because I've never been in debt. I have always navigated my way through being self-employed, staying in abundance. And I think it's really important that we help people to let go of their fear and to trust their skills and gifts that are going to morph and shape and change. And that, to stay in the flow of, you know, and sometimes I do love listening to people like Bashar, um, who would say, you know, abundance is the ability to do what you need to do when you need to do it. And it really is that simple. Yeah, brilliant. Is Bashar, um, is there a, the, the human man is bored with glasses. Yes. And he talks really fast. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've, seen a, I've caught a couple of his videos. Um, very interesting, very interesting um, like character. Yeah, sorry, let me turn this noisy for you. Say that again. He sounds like Jim Carrey on speed a bit. It's quite <laughs> funny, you know, his delivery of how he speaks. Apparently, he's linked to the Sasani being, he's a version of Daryl, apparently, light years in the future. But it doesn't really matter who this being is that he's channeling. To be honest with you, he's got some good advice for people. Mm -hmm. and he's funny and if people could apply that it would work but I think the thing that I'm saying about what we're saying about employment and where things are going to go and how people are going to have to change and I really see more people becoming self-employed um, and I, I think the reason people go into a meltdown or a fear is we're back to going into the ancestral programming the past lives the inner child the beliefs that they have about employment and about how they're going to create abundance and you know like you just said earlier you know the parents have put in them oh you can't do this job you have to do this job you won't make a living out of that or you know this is going to be hard and actually the truth of it is it isn't but the program beliefs you know which are very deeply stored in the subconscious have got to be all healed now and that is going to come up for people as they newly find themselves in you know an opportunity for self-employment you're right. You know, I think there's an awful lot of people, adults, they've, they've, they've been so programmed 
in order to be or look successful, you have to have this size house, this kind of car, this many children, this many holidays. And it's all bollocks. It's absolute bollocks. The, the definition of a happy person, like in Costa Rica, they live in these really little tin, little houses and the rains come and you've never heard so much laughter. There's no TV, you know, and it's just so beautiful to see these people who are so family orientated, so full of love and care. And they're like the Mexicans in the way that they turn their children out, like the hair is, I love that. They're so proud of their children and they present them, you know, because that makes them feel good. But in the Western world, you know, with all of this travesty and the systems collapsing and people thinking, God, how am I going to pay my mortgage? How am I going to pay my health insurance? I am so appalled on, in a rage at the health system in America in particular, where health insurance comes before life and always has. It's poor people. It's so sad. But something had to crumble, crumble, come down, change, ship, because the powers that be, they're not allowed to hold the power anymore. We're not ever going to have again any of these people that are in power for 40 years. What is that about? I'm so tired of white men in suits running my say that. planet. You know, how can, how can, I mean, in, in the UK, if you saw the people, which I don't know if you've seen because you're abroad, um, if you've seen the UK health experts, supposedly, I've never seen more sick and ill people in my life. And you're supposedly the health expert telling the people right. about health. You know, it, it's blatantly obvious how much common sense do you need to be able to see, do not listen to these people. They cannot heal themselves. So what wisdom do they have for you? And they're not letting you know about more. Here we go. Boring. Yeah. Bo just got, you just got frozen. Yeah. Oh more natural things um and and that you know it's false economy not to invest in your inner self because you know it's like when you see people say oh but i you know i've, I've got sick and ill i need money for a transplant um well no you can avoid that if you heal and do this inner work change your diet change your lifestyle look at all that you won't need the money for this big surgery thing necessarily if you can prevent it you know you know the problem is with holistic therapy or the realm that we work in is a lot of the time sadly it people only come to see us when they're at a crisis like they've reached a brick wall and instead of seeing the other people who i love working with which is they see it as self-maintenance you know it's it's like a life force feeding them by doing this inner work to keep their vibration high. Whereas the others, they're just about to hit a brick wall when they decide to do this. Yeah. And, you know, and a lot of people, unfortunately, they want to avoid hurting. They want to avoid questioning. They want to avoid going against authority on every level. And so they'll keep suffering and suffering and suffering and taking that four by four around the head and making, making themselves acquiesce here and there. Oh, so as not to offend, you know, the authoritative energy, whatever that might look like. And we're at that point where now we're like, excuse me, we're all siblings on this planet together. We all agree together. No one's allowing any hierarchical group anymore. It's done, donezo on every single level. And people are coming into that. They're coming into that loving self-awareness. And again, we mentioned those that are gonna have to really let go of the mortgage, let go of the big house, the cars, the clothes, the holidays. For now, none of that's important. Your mental health, your emotional health, your loving connection to you, then to your family and friends. These are the treasures of the planet. There are ways, there's always been ways to nourish, to help, to heal. The other thing that's gonna happen in this whole rebalancing is there will never ever be another starving child in the Sudan, for example, ever again. Once the revelation and the, the band-aids ripped off and the screen comes down and we the people see what the systems have done, how they have traumatized and harmed so many people on our planet. Those people that hold those frequencies of authority, done.
goodbye mm. and no no thank you and it i think it's encouraging people to see that you know, you are going to have to perhaps make, like Danny said, some changes temporarily and they might be permanent. They might not be. It's like I moved to this house when I was deciding I need to be mortgage free. So I'm going to buy a smaller house. And there's, I don't want a mortgage. I don't want to be forced to have to work um, because I can be in a higher level of integrity when I don't have to earn money to pay my mortgage or to pay my rent, you know, I can afford. And I knew at that point in my life, I really needed to rest. I, I knew it's identifying a point in your life you're at and identifying what it is in that moment that you need and to do that thing. And like the other day I was in the, at the beach and there was a guy walking a load of dogs and he said, oh, I'm a dog walker. I got made redundant. He said, and now I'm a dog walker and I, I'm earning more money than ever, you know, as a dog walker. And I said, well, how much do you earn? And he got six dogs, 60 pounds an hour. And he said, I'm on my third outing today already. And it was only like 11 o'clock. And, um, and it was his joy, you know, it was his absolute joy to be with these dogs. And you know what? I had never saw such a well-behaved group of dogs all together. They didn't jump at me because they were happy with themselves. And, you know, he was doing an amazing job helping all these dogs have fun together, you know, because they were all having so much fun. And he was being paid for doing something that was not only helping the dogs, but also helping himself and helping the owners. So it was like a win-win on every level. And I think when people see that people will always pay you for doing whatever is your spark, your initiative, your joy, you know, somebody will identify that and want to pay you for that. No matter how bizarre and odd it seems, as long as you don't limit yourself. And I think I see so many people sabotage. They're really good at something, but they sabotage the self-employment aspect of it because they try to bring in the 3D employer reality to it when they don't need to do that. Definitely. And that, that dog walker, you know, he clearly was in his absolute joy and passion. And because he was so balanced and happy in his energy, because dogs are so sensitive, they're responding to that. You know, and there's always been that from, from a, a long, long time, like if we can do what we love, if we can find that passion, if we can be in that passion and not worry about, well, you know, I really love to work in a supermarket. I love the idea of scanning all the things, but I don't want my neighbors to come in and see me and think I'm a weirdo or I'm poor or I can't afford to X, Y, and Z. Or some people that just want to keep themselves busy doing something that others might, you know, deem menial. None of it is important. People are realizing they can share a house, they can rent a room, they can buy pool money, buy land together, build small homes, have a communal area for planting food and gardens, you know, and that, and this will even get into how many of the seeds have disappeared on the planet, how much GMO and pesticides, etc. That's a whole other, like, two-week non-stop conversation. Uh, but yeah, it's taking back power. It's being in the passion. It's deciding, you know what? This is going to kill me, man. This stress is going to kill me. Is it worth giving my life to this stress and pressure I'm under? No, is the answer. No. And Where I, is the self-love? Where is the self-care, right? Talking about the supermarket, I had a client once who he was between jobs for a while and he had you know, quite, quite a high power job, but he was between jobs. And because he still needed to earn a bit of money, he went to the supermarket and he was doing the packing for the home delivery for the supermarkets. And once he got a proper job, um, which was more in keeping with his qualifications or what he wanted to do, he said, oh no, I still work there on a Saturday doing that job. And I said, oh, why is that? He said, it's the most fun I have, I love it. And so he uh, still wanted to do that job because he loved it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, and he found something that was more fun than what he actually was qualified for, but he still wanted to do something else. And I think that's the thing, you sometimes find yourself drifting it's like how i ended up doing this i didn't set out to do this i kind of drifted into to this 
experience of helping people. I didn't set my intention to do this. I just found that this was what the, the door opened and I walked through it and off it went. Yeah, it's incredible. And, and yeah, finding your joy, finding your passion, you know, training, doing the training, you know, you need and making sure that if you have like in our situations, you and I, if you have a person that you're holding in the palm of your hand while you're taking them through change, transformation, self love, you know, I always say to people, I am love. And I always say to people, I'm the mirror and I'm reflecting back who you are in all your beautiful ways, your valuable ways. So there's ownership because as you and I both know as therapists, there's something called transference where somebody will come to see you like they see their doctor and they have that mindset. And then I've had people, they think they're in love with me. They're not in love with me. There is that same figure of authority essence that's going on. They look at you, they think you have all the answers and they're transferring their power to you. But we're in a position now where we are, you know, owning our own power. Now, I was working with a teenage boy and his dad last week. Um, but dad is really harsh on this boy, really harsh. And yes, I did take the dad to one side and told him in the most, you know, kind way I possibly could, you're an asshole. Um, and you've got to stop beating this kid up because you're projecting onto him what you weren't able to do. And here's how you can do this for you. But leave this kid alone, dude. I was a lot more elegant than that, of course. But my point is this, this child has wanted to and shown great aptitude for guitar playing and graphic design drawing. But his father is determined that he will go to college, he will have a degree and he will be a lawyer. That's his father's projection. This kid is depressed, he has anxiety, he's not functioning, he just wants to be in his room on those bloody video games. And the dad is dogging, 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 like stop dogging your kids, stop pushing them into corners that they don't fit in. Let them find themselves. So they're watching us, our kids are watching us what we're doing, how we're handling this crisis that we're in globally, you know, with all these, uh, you know, systems collapsing and people being proven to be liars and cheaters and deceivers. You know, we've got to let the younger generation come up and start helping, giving us ideas, putting forth their passions, suggesting things to us so we can let go of, hold on, I have to be this certain symbol of authority in your life. No, maybe you don't. And I, and I think you also, don't. you know, as we're seeing this healthcare system collapse in the UK, definitely, I think the NHS is going away, you know, and it, whether it's privatized or whatever happens, I think also um, the problem you've got also is it's expensive to become a doctor in the UK. I think it costs a hundred thousand pounds to train to be a doctor. So if your parents have invested that kind of money in you, I've seen people who are whistleblower doctors talking about this in you know YouTube videos and saying it's very hard when you because you only do five hours even on nutrition. I think in in that course. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, if you're family have invested all that money in you and then it's like my son the doctor my daughter the doctor um you can't as you then realize this isn't right for my soul this isn't who i am i want to help people but perhaps i'm going down the wrong path and they spent all this money on me it feels like a betrayal to the family dynamic you know you're like the golden child of the family you know like oh you know and now you're going to fall from grace in their perception because you're going actually no i don't want to do that anymore i'm going to be an acupuncturist instead or you know or actually the truth is i want to be working in a coffee shop it's all too stressful I don't want to do that anymore and it's the guilt then that you feel like oh my parents have spent all this money on me I can't then back away from what my training is or what my university degree is or all these things so it's so much pressure put on you as a child and I think these new kids now are not going to take that. They're like, no, I know who I am. I know what I want to do. I'm not going to be bullied or pushed by, I'm your loving parent, but I'm going to bully and push you in this direction. I think they're more liable to stand up and say, no, I'm going to do something completely different. And I think all these new, well, they're not new holistic therapies. It's just, they're going to become more accessible to the masses. I think the masses are going to find themselves 
reaching out for help where they previously wouldn't have considered this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Absolutely. There's definitely a need to insert the frequency of love in every single human, in every single way, uh, across the entire planet. You know, even the R swipes at the top, you know, who've been forced and fracked and, and traumatized on some level themselves, you know, finding that love. And however, I mean, there are some that probably just aren't able to ever get to that level of empathy, because if you can't feel, if you can't empathize with others, then <laughs> what are you, a stone? Um, you know, but yeah, for us, you know, the masses, and it is the masses, the majority, you know, raising that love vibration inside, having that self-care, that self-nurturing, realizing that people around you aren't on the planet for your gain, for your benefit. You can't live your life vicariously through them. You don't need to force them into any kind of particular thinking because it's not fair. Each soul in each individual body has its own right to do what it wants to do what it wants. That is a universal truth. And I, I think people make bad choices as well. And it's seeing people to get them to become visionary. It's like I had a friend once who lived in Hawaii and he had a great house on the best drive, you know, there. And he was a builder. And then when we went through a recession, the, there was no construction work in Hawaii. And when I met him, he'd lost his, his house. His property had been repossessed. And I said to him, why didn't you leave the house and rent it out as a vacation rental? Why did you not go and live in a studio flat for a while and get yourself some income by renting this house out? And then you would, you know, pay off your mortgage. And it's getting people to think differently. You know, there are people who get paid for being house sitters. You know, there are all kinds of things you can do, you know, to survive. You, you know, I see people say, saying, oh, I'm struggling, you know, and then I see they're driving a car that has a high intake of petrol, it guzzles petrol. Well, get rid of that car, get yourself a cheaper car that, ha you know, it's, it's little things that you do that can bring abundance to you. And, you know, if you're really, really struggling, there are things you can omit from your life right now and prioritise other things don't panic don't go into fear don't go into this panic oh my god oh my god i'm frozen in terror what am i gonna do you know just relax because when you go into the fear and terror you narrow your perception of reality down so they become like blinkered like a horse they can't they're not visionary anymore they can't see ideas and opportunities they are just like getting more tunnel vision and then the more tunnel vision they get depressed Absolutely. And it's such a good um, example. You were the guy with, in Hawaii, like they were going to lose the house and he could have moved out into the studio and they had rented it out. And it's a lot of people that can get their head around that concept. There's an electrician I met recently, American, lovely man. And he was telling me, he's been in Costa Rica for 18 years. He was telling me that he was so well paid in America. He comes here, he's easily on a third of the money. But amazingly enough, every single month, there's more money in his bank account than he had when he was earning more in the States. Because in countries like Costa Rica, you're not paying car insurance in the way that we do there. It's like $100 a year for the year. You know, there's so much greed and grabbing in all of the systems that should be absolutely banned and stopped. Certain taxes, all of that nonsense. You know, so there's different ways we can live around the world for certain periods of time. There's something called the digital nomad now, and it's become very popular for people to go overseas, rent their homes out, or if they're in rentals, just clear out, get a, a unit, store your stuff, bugger off. You can still carry on working online. There are countries opening, giving uh, visas to people that can prove they can support themselves financially, you know, while they're building up. It is so amazing. And some of the countries, you don't need the thing up the nose and the what's it do dar up your butt. And, you know, it's, there's a lot of freedom still. And so a lot of very sensible governments and loving people on the planet. And, you know, removing the hand of fear is where we're at. And it depends to each individual. How are we going to do that? But like giving the thought, the sustaining thought, sustainability, how can I sustain my life? What's the most important thing? Your mental health. 
yeah. for and physical I, health. I think you have to, I mean, back in 2008, I always saw people in person. And then I got an opportunity, I was still living in London, I was renting, and um, my landlord didn't want to renew my tenancy. And I trusted my intuition and I knew to put my stuff in storage. And I went traveling and I went to Sedona. It's synchronicity guided me to Sedona. I'd never heard of Sedona. I didn't know it was this spiritual center. And I was just Googling and I found this place called Dream Make Away um, in Sedona and it was called Dream Maker Cottage. And off I went there for two months, didn't know anybody, just thought it's the right thing to do, had an amazing experience. And then I realized that I didn't, I loved seeing people in person like you do. We love seeing people in person, but I also didn't want to be fixed to the same venue. I wanted to live my job, but still be able to do my gift. And then all of a sudden, like this voice gifted me with, well, you know, you could be anywhere. I'm like, well, how does that work? And then clients started to say, well, can't I work with you over Skype or the phone? And I was like, oh, and then it just started to happen that way, you know, and then I started singing light language as well, which helped the sessions. And that's the thing, Once once you identify that you're not happy with something, even though you love doing it, I didn't want to sit on a chair in the same place for eight hours a day. It wasn't that I didn't love what I was doing. I needed to expand what I was doing in a way that meant I could be anywhere. Sometimes I'm in the car talking to people. You know, they're some of my best sessions from the car. (laughs) Yeah, it's amazing. It is amazing. Yeah, really, really. Well, I think that we've definitely um, kind of gone through a lot of really beautiful options for people. I think that we hopefully have allowed more of an opening for people to go down certain avenues of how they can deal with their emotional well-being, eliminate stress and anxiety, be okay with changing, downsizing, whatever it is they need to do to feel better, feel stronger, and not be so kidnapped or held to ransom by what they've been programmed that they should do yeah you're gaining your freedom that's you know and you're so you know i call what i do soul freedom awakening but it's like your soul freedom is everything you know that's how you become a wealthy soul you know Mm. um i once thought about writing a book called (laughs) traveling first class in economy mentally not physically and then i thought the other side was for wealthy people who were traveling um traveling in economy in first class Brilliant. You know, and Brilliant. when you're in that economy, and I noticed that years ago, once I was paying for my own flights, and because sometimes I was having flights paid for and I'd be in business class or occasionally first class with modeling, and it was great, but I was under the restriction of other people. But once you were truly paying your own way, you know, the seat grew bigger. It was like the seat grew bigger, and I had so much freedom. I wasn't having to to listen to other people's nonsense. You're truly free, you know, your freedom is worth so much. Your freedom is like making you a trillionaire, you know, you're a trillionaire freedom person is how I see it. Mm-hmm. And I think, I think Danny's a good example too, that, you know, once you know that all, no matter what happens, that all the skills and gifts are inside of you. They're in you. They're going to come out of you and be shared with the world. Then no matter what you face, you know that if you lost it all, you just make it all back um, because you are this eternal soul, this self-generating system with ideas, inspiration, thoughts. And if you act on those, people will always, you know, recompense you for that. I mean, back in the day, I loved living in Sloan Square in London and it was expensive. And I set up a shop in my house called the Chelsea Princess Shopping Club. And um, I turned my house into a shop. And, you know, it was purely because I loved twinkly things and I wanted to sell those things. And I also wanted to stay in that location. And I was like, how am I going to make this rent keep flowing? And you do, once you set your intention for what is my greatest joy and excitement in that moment and the job that you're doing. And I think the other thing is people think that they've got to stay with that job. No, you could do that job for a week and then that's it. You could go and do something else. It's like being in that flow, isn't it? Absolutely. 
absolutely. One thing I will share here um, <clears throat> is that, and I know you know this, um, years ago, and I'm talking 2006, 2007, my former husband and I were very wealthy, what I consider very wealthy, millions of dollars. And we made our money in buying apartment buildings and renovating them and turning them into condos. It was the thing to do at that time. We had buildings from San Diego all the way down to Texas and beyond. And then blah, 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 we lost the entire amount. Now, here's the biggest thing I learned about having millions of dollars. If I owed $150,000 a month on taxes on my buildings, which I did. It was the same stress I felt when I didn't have that wealth and I owed somebody $150. The only difference is there was way more to lose at the higher end of having wealth. And as lovely as having all those millions was, it kind of sucked as well. Because what you do is this, you start to live according to the size of your bank account. You start buying the Porsches and the Mercedes, etc. And there's nothing wrong with that. They're be it's beautiful. Oh, the upkeep. Oh, the maintenance. It is so much more, so much more, so much more. And I was so mindful of coming from both, you know, equations, you know, having absolutely fuck all to suddenly having like everything and, and then realizing like, oh, I think I resonate better here. And I used to think, well, what am I going to do with all this money? I know I can give it to this person. And that's what I was doing. I was literally helping as many people. It felt amazing. It felt amazing. And I didn't do it with audience. Like, don't do it with audience. You know, unless you're in the public eye, that's a really good thing. If you are mega wealthy and you are in the public eye, I think it's really beautiful if you do show where you're putting your money to help your brothers and sisters. But I think, you know, some people are like, look what I have done. I have made fire. I have given them life because I gave them, you know, there's a difference in how you share what you have. But anyway, back to my point, the stress levels of 150 grand on taxes to $150 or pounds to a friend or whatever, very similar. So, and, and, and either way, it was not worth it. My lesson was, how am I going to deal with that stress? How am I going to choose to look at all these different situations? Focus on my emotional, physical, and mental well-being first. Yeah, and it's, it's living with that stress. You know, I've seen people where, you know, and I feel for them, I'm like, oh, I'm so sorry to hear you're down to your last million. It must be really stressful. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but it, but they are stressed. Um, and then you see somebody else who it feels super abundant. I feel super abundant. I live in my van, you know, and they don't have any stress. They're really happy. You know, it's a bit like, you know, where, where I live, I do talk a lot to people and, and sort of was helping a lot of people who live on the streets in the lockdown. But in the UK, they got put in um, property. A lot of them got, especially if they were ex-military, they got housed really easily. Um, mm. But they're all back on the streets now because they're like, I hate it. I don't want to live in a property. I because of their complex post-traumatic stress they want they enjoy being on the streets they enjoy the freedom they don't want to be accountable to anyone so they feel more abundant and their life skills are they can survive you know so we have to be careful not to judge people because it's you know everybody's trying to find a way to live stress-free in whatever space they're in yeah. and it's getting people over that it's trying to get them through the anxiety to go into this place of expansion within themselves instead of going, oh, well, I never feel anxiety, but I've made my world so small that I hardly don't do anything. And it's getting people to expand out of that. It's that comfort zone, isn't it? And, and really expanding themselves, which I think everything that's gone on in this last two years now is forcing people like, they're coming through the birth canal, aren't they, into this new world. And it is going to be maybe difficult. It's going to be a bit of a contraction before you expand out. Yeah, definitely. Andrea, I could talk to you for the next two <laughs> weeks and I'll start quite easily. Now, how can people get hold of you, book okay. a session with you and enjoy your wisdom? Oh, well, that's very kind. Um, 
I have a website, andreafaux.com, which I think people can see. And maybe Danny will put a link below, which is, and then I'm on Facebook, I'm on YouTube. I've got loads of videos on YouTube, loads of free videos. If people want to see me back to the beginning when I was doing this morning and TV stuff and regressions. And then I speak light language as well. So I have lots of free light languages on my YouTube channel as well. And then I think I did do a few videos on TikTok as well. <laughs> <laughs> and um i think that helps a different age group as well isn't yeah it? yeah definitely definitely yeah there's so much content out there you've been at this for over 20 years you've been so brave and such a warrior and a leader especially on mainstream television in the united kingdom scotland ireland and wales it has been quite the quite the journey andrea fox and you're still here helping everyone with your love and your your great uplifting personality and i invite everyone out there who sees this beautiful girl my friend to go and explore her services so andrea thank you so much is there any final words that you have um i think it's just to trust you know really trust that you know we are going through this biggest change that we've in our lifetimes in this incarnation we will never go through this bigger change it's like you know this is the biggest change we will ever face but we chose to be here in a physical body on this planet in this time for this experience nobody is by like they got lost in the universe and ended up here everybody is here because they wanted this experience to be here good point very good point. yeah well, until exactly. next time you're welcome. All right, guys, thanks for joining us. We do hope that we've given you something to think about, that we maybe have uplifted you in some way, brought you love, brought some ideas for you to have to think about and consider. All right, I send you my love and I see you soon.